today. And I'm very sure all of us are going to gain fruitful insights and nuggets of wisdom from our um, experienced guest here. Uh, on this call, we have two guests. We have Mr. Matthew Abango and Abongo, and we have Dr. June Madete. But before we start with our guests, I would like um, our president for IEEE, uh, Mr. Alan Koech, to introduce himself and tell us a little bit about IEEE for those who have joined the call and they don't know more about it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm not in clear. Let me confirm that. Can you hear me? Yes, you yes, can hear you. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So, um, as Chris, Christine has mentioned, my name is Alan Koech. I'm a fifth year biomedical engineering student at Kenyatta University. Uh, I'm also the chairperson at Poly KU, as well as chairperson at uh, Poly Photonic Society, Kenyatta University and Chapter. So, H Poly is a um, is a non-profit organization, of course. So, it's a um, one of the most, it's the largest actually um, tech and professional community, which is there in the world, which actually um, deals with a lot of things and on matters, engineering and technology, plus the issues around standards. So being a member of IEEE, what do you gain? A lot of things you gain actually. So one, you gain a lot of skills. Two, you gain um, to, to improve your network. That is uh, through workshops like this, you meet to meet uh, professional members in the field like uh, our guests today, so you can interact with them, uh, grow your network, as well as gain things and um, and some new skills. Actually, yeah. So, so um, what I just encourage all of you because um, I know that some of us already are, who are members and some of us who are not. So I will encourage all of you that um, please take an initiative, a personal initiative to be a member of IH Poly because um. For those who, have joined, who are members, they can surely tell you there are a lot of benefits which you gain as an IEEE member, which is not just limited to gaining more skills. There are issues around uh, getting to access the biggest publication, that is the IEEE Explore, which has a lot of journals, uh, technical papers, and all, all those things. As well as uh, by being an IEEE member, you get a chance to... If you write a technical paper, you get a chance to if it's approved to be published in the HPOLI Explore, which is one of the biggest uh, technical uh, library. And uh, as for us who have ever tried to, who have, who have ever done some projects, you find that uh, if you're then trying to get some of the information for your project, like uh, some technical aspects of it, usually if you Google it on the Google website, you'll find that it will usually take you to HPOLI. Uh, explore library and you should find that you'll be told to play space um maybe four dollars five dollars per per paper but by being an IEEE member you get a free access to all those uh, publications so being a member it has a lot of benefits not just in that um, also by writing papers and uh, submitting them for, for conferences you can get a chance to even uh, present your paper in the conference which will be abroad, or even even if the COVID was not uh, was not there for now, you could have even got a chance to even fly abroad to even present a paper in front of uh, other scholars and engineers. So there are a lot of benefits um, which I can't outline all of them right now because of time. But by being an actual member, you have a lot to gain. So yes, it's just a small fee for student members around for now. It's around thirteen point five dollars. Uh, to join HPOLI. It's actually, it was previously $27, but there's a 50% um, waiver for that. So you get $13.5 to join HPOLI as a student member. And um, because this talk today is brought to you by uh, HPOLI uh, EMBS, this engineering in medicine and biology society. So you can also join HPOLI, the University of Mumbai, then EMBS, which is now the host of this uh, panel discussion today. And um, if you're enthusiastic in matters health, um, technology around health, then then EMBS actually is an, is an add-on which is actually a, a best choice for those who are actually, who are actually biomedical engineers. So 
PNDS is the right choice for you. Although also that also depends on your choices. There are other many other societies which are in Irish police and um, you can join any of them depending on your choices and your liking. There are almost 40 of them. And um, you can also join, join an Irish police society and also join what's normally called the uh, they have committees inside those societies which deal with matters like standards, setting the standards for for the world. For instance, we are talking now around 5G. There are a lot of 5G rumors, uh, stories online. So there's a committee in h police that actually deals with the standards around 5G. There's another committee which deals with matters around uh, things like uh, Wi-Fi, um, Bluetooth, all those technologies which we normally use. So they're the ones who set, set the standards and set the the requirements for uh, a technology, a technology to be used on uh, maybe by the humans, so they certify that this technology is fit for use and fit for, for purpose. So joining H Poly will help you, as I said earlier, in your professional career as well as in your academic career. So I don't take much time. I just say thank you uh, for all of us who have joined today and for our guests. Welcome, and. Uh, I, do, I want to say feel at home because yeah, welcome to H Poly as well. And um, I wish all of us. Um, I hope you, everyone of us, has carried some notebook to at least write some few notes from what uh, for the discussion we shall be having today with our guests. And maybe in the end, please take your time, ask questions, seek uh, ask questions, seek a uh, clarification, make an observation. Yeah, that's how you grow your knowledge. So thank you. Back to you, Christine. Uh, thank you so much, Coach, for that insightful introduction about H Police. And just as Coach has said, H Police is an umbrella that houses so many societies. Like personally, I'm a member of three societies, and both of them have been very beneficial to me as a student and throughout my coursework. Uh, but today, I'm representing EMBS. I'm the current chairperson for Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society. And I have my team here. Most of them have also joined. We have Stella on the call. We have Stacy. We have Ashton. And we have many other uh, IEEE students on the call. I can see them. Um, apart from that, there's also another society called Women in Engineering, which I'm also a member. And I know we also have representatives from Women in Engineering on this call. And I'd like all of us who are on this call, and maybe you haven't joined IEEE or you don't know the benefits, you have heard from coach and personally i've been able the benefits i've gotten so far for the two years i've been a member of IEEE. i've managed to network with very many people in the industry the top-notch engineers i've also uh, enjoyed their treats in having uh, attending conferences in big hotels that i could not manage to attend if it was not for IEEE. i've also managed to get myself doing projects that have been recognized nationally simply because of networking with co-minded individuals in IEEE. So I'd like to encourage all of us here, all the students, um, to join IEEE, and we are ready to mentor you through and guide you if you need any help. So on this call today, our main topic is a smooth transition from school to the industry, and we invited two guests uh, who I'll give a chance to introduce themselves in a few seconds. But uh, today I'll be moderating this session with, alongside my colleague Ashton. And I look forward to all of us gaining. There's something Coach mentioned that one of our lecturers, Engineer Zomo, says whenever you attend a conference or any meeting, make sure you ask a question, you seek clarification, you seek application, or just make sure that you interact and you are recognized that you're on this call and you get to go away with something from such a unique presentation or interaction. So I'd like to uh, allow our guests to introduce themselves. I'll start with um, Dr. Madete. Dr. Madete is our lecturer. Kindly introduce yourself to the um, people in the meeting. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is June Madete. Um, I'd like to, I'm really excited to hear about, uh, I'll put my video on. I'm really excited to hear about um, what uh, the 
the IEEE uh, is doing and what are the importance of um, so uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be here and uh, looking forward to the interactions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Matthew, can you introduce yourself also? Thank you so much, Tim. Um, it's my joy to join you um, in this uh, panel of discussion. Uh, I'm always I'm always a bit uh, a bit uh, hesitant really to uh, to talk about so many things because when you're seated in a panel of uh, of experts, you know sometimes you want to learn more from them than they will learn from you. Uh, but uh, it's my joy to be part of this team. Uh, Christine, thank you so much for the invitation. I think uh, um, you, you are patient enough with me to get today to work. Uh, I was really afraid that today again was not going to work because of, uh, because of schedules. But uh, um, over and above that, I'm, I'm happy to, to be part of this great team uh, of professionals uh, who I think, uh, uh, me being one of them, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Um, to, to, to join, uh, I mean, you to join us in the professional field. Uh, Dr. Madete, um, good to know you, and um, also thank you for just guiding this team to who they are. So um, a, a little bit of, uh, of me, if you'll allow me, Christine. Um, I'm the human resource manager for a company called Megascope Healthcare Limited. What we deal with is um, uh, we are in the, in, in the hospital, uh, hospital industry. And uh, we we sell, maintain, and uh, you know work with hospitals uh, across the country. And uh, I lead a team of engineers like you. Uh, I, lead a team, I lead a team of also operations uh, staff members uh, who support uh, the medical engineering team. Basically, um, um, a good part of uh, our office staff members are biomedical engineers. So it's an environment that is uh, that is uh, quite informative. This has not been my background. I wasn't trained as a biomedical engineer, but uh, just working around you guys um, is, is so warm. So I think probably with that background, with that background, uh, I, I think that's the reason why Christian looked for me from one of my colleagues, and I am here today to learn more from you and also to listen uh, to what you guys do. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Um, I hope now all of us are conversant with our speakers today. We have a human resource manager from Megascope. Megascope is a flourishing uh, healthcare company here in Kenya at the moment. And we also have a senior lecturer from Kenyatta University who is into academia. And I'd like everyone here to be free to ask any questions and to seek clarification if you have any. And I'd like us to have a very interactive session today. And maybe from my side, I can start with the first question. I'll direct it to Mr. Matthew. Because mostly the HR is the one who is responsible for hiring in companies, and your company is dealing with biomedical engineers, uh, I'd like to know, or rather would like to know, what are the, some of the skill sets that you look into an individual before you hire them? And most of the time, many companies require people with experience. Does it mean that... As graduate, as graduate engineers, you don't have space in these companies uh, way early when you're starting our careers. Does it mean I can't get a position at Megascope since I don't have experience? Thank you, Christian, for that question. Um, I think it's the elephant, uh, elephant in the house. Actually, this question about experience or new graduates is, is a big deal for many of you, and for sure, um, many of our, you know, many of the companies, many of the corporate companies will insist, will insist on specific um, experience level and specific skill set that people come, uh, 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 you know, are, are expected to, to come with. But now, uh, does it mean, therefore, that Christine and your colleagues, you will never get jobs because uh, then you will not have the five years experience that somebody is requiring? Now, what I do in Megascope um, is. Uh, uh, yes, I insist on the number of years of experience, but sometimes I close my eye, especially when I'm doing shortlisting. And I know many of my colleagues in practice, many of the HR uh, managers in practice, uh, would, would do the same because um, because of this reason. Myself, what I do for Megascope is 
if Christine, for example, applies for a position that I've advertised for in, in mega school, and uh, you're daring enough to apply for it, it, it it's asking for um, five years experience as a biomedical engineer, and you've sent an application, I will, I will look for a few characteristics of what kind of a person you are in your application. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this is because I want us to get this very clear. That apart from a few of us who are lucky enough to get jobs, the many of us who struggle to get the jobs will only do this through the documentation that you send to us. And many graduates take some of these things for granted. For example, I applied for a job yesterday in company X, and then I see a similar position in Megascope today. And before I even read through the job advert, I've copy pasted the application of yesterday and sent to Matthew without changing anything. It's a common mistake that we get from professionals that you know get us really worried in terms of how vulnerable we are or you know how easy we are going in terms of doing our applications. So this is what I would advise you as professionals. Already you have the skill set that is required. Dr. Madete has given you the training that you need, for example. She has given you the, uh, the training that Matthew requires in the industry. So how do you translate that training that you have in the field into an actual explanation that if I call you in a panel of interview, you can be able to tell me that you have confidence you can be able to work on, 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 a, on a CT scan, for example. So the skill set that we require outside here is exactly what you're being taught in class. The only difference between you and the person who's already in the field is time. The person in the field also started at you, but they have already built experience. So therefore, in this industry, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, this kind of industry where we are as Megascope, we know that um, there's a lot of transition, really. Uh, today, I have somebody with five years experience. They get a job elsewhere in a competitor. There is a gap I have here. How do I fill it? I fill it up by bringing you in. So when I call you in for an interview, how you present the skill set that you've learned in school, how you present the skill set that you've learned during your internship is exactly what will make you, um, you know, have the difference with the rest of the people. So sometimes we, we call you guys for an interview just to dare you also, to hear you, what you really have, what you, what you can be able to tell us. Now, when I ask you the question, tell us about yourself. Now, many of you will go and cram what is on Google and you want to, you know, make it look so good on you while you forget actually what that question is asking for. That question is asking for a um, for, uh, question like, why are you even the best? Why did you apply for this, uh, this position? So I'm actually asking you to start giving me the kind of skill set that you have. Yes, you'll start telling me that you are Christine Were, for example, but am I really interested in your name when you're answering that question? You already sent me your documents. I know you're Christine. So why would you want to start by telling me that you're Christine Were, you are 23 years old, you know, you have gone to KU, for example. Yes, I can see the, all that in, in, in the CV. But the reason why I will get tired as a, as a HR to listen to you, and I will give you five minutes, and I will dismiss you from that interview, is because you're telling me things that are your bio data that I can be able to get from the document. What I need from you when you are, I'm asking you that question, tell us about yourself. I need a summary of the skills and qualifications. Now, where do I get this? When I receive your CV, the first thing I will look at is the first page of your CV. Is there value in the first page of your CV so that I can be able to go to the second page of your CV? I would like to uh, uh, my colleagues. At this level, I know many of you have five pages CV, three pages CV, some of you have eight pages CV. So if I ask you today to send me your CV and I find at this level, you guys are still students, at this level, you have a five page CV. The question I will ask myself is, what is in that CV? It could be repeat things. It could be things that are necessary. Um, um, uh, and at this level, allow me to, to bring this in. As a HR, I will be looking at two kinds of CVs. I'll be looking at a functional CV and a chronological CV. Chronological is where you put all the stuff from primary level into high school, into you know the university and everything you've done in the university, the clubs that you, you have, you, that you've joined, the membership that you have, and all that. That's a chronological CV. It gives us everything about your career. Let's understand what a CV is. It's a curriculum vitae. 
it, it has everything about your curriculum. Now, when you're looking at a functional CV, this is where Matthew from Megascope is looking for an expertise in MRI, for example. Now, how then do you remove all the issues do with that function that I'm looking at and put it in the CV? So therefore, a functional CV would be a maximum of two pages. So the eight pages that you have now as students is not bad. I am saying that is having all your chronological things, but that is not what I'm looking for when I advertise for a position. I need a functional CV where you are able to reduce your CV to the function that you are actually applying for. Now, that will then reduce the copy-pasting problem that you are having. And the reason why nowadays, as HRs, we are investing in software that is able to sieve the CVs to the keywords that we have used in the advertisements. So if you didn't know, now you know that many HRs will not call you for an interview, and you will actually wait for those interviews. Why? Because now we have robots in the form of software that will always sieve the CVs and the application that is sent to us to the specific ones that I need to read. Because I do an advertisement today and I say the deadline is tomorrow, I will receive 600 plus applications. Now, is there time for me to read all those CVs? No. So then I take them through a system that will be able to sieve the CVs to the functions that you're talking about. So therefore, you must really reduce your CV to the function component so that then you can be picked out by the system and then you can be called and also defend the task. So the skill set that we're looking at here is exactly what you've learned in school, but now how you translate it to the real life so that someone can give you a chance to, to move on. Now, when we take you in as a fresh graduate, as an employer, I know I must take you through training because you don't know what I deal with. I have to take you through training. So give me that chance to give you the employment, then I take you through the training. And the training is actual experience that now you get. So, Christine, I don't know where, whether I'm, I'm, I'm tackling the question that you have. Yes, yes, you are tackling it very well. Thank you. So let me leave it at that as I wait for other questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I actually had a question on CV and what kind of CV, but I'm very grateful you've been able to clarify on that issue. Because most of us, we normally have a problem with which ki what kind of a CV should we have. Should we have a resume, a CV? What do I include? Why do I, what do I exclude? But it's now clear to all of us here. Maybe just a follow-up question on that. Apart from employment, um, can some of us maybe get chances for volunteering or internships? Do you offer such? Now, as a company, um, I've deliberately uh, created a policy on, uh, on internships. Um, you'll realize that this industry is a very sensitive industry in the sense that um, we are dealing with uh, cases of life and death. Because when you're sent out to the field to work on the machines, it, either you have the knowledge or you don't have it. So for the longest time that I can remember, Megascope has never had uh, um, a, a chance, for example. I'm talking about Megascope because I'm here. Other organizations, I'm not very sure how we deal with it. We have never had a policy really to deal with internships, but we are opening up our doors. Now, how we are dealing with it is that uh, if you have a chance to intern with us here, it must be a formal application process. Now, I've said that uh, our industry is funny because we deal with real-time issues, real-time breakdowns, real-time calls from, from, uh, from the hospitals that a machine is down. You have to diagnose either on phone as you wait to go there. You have to give instructions on how, what needs to be done. And sometimes the breakdowns happen when there is a patient being attended to. So um, um, many, 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 many of um, such kind of industry um, you know, players would be very hesitant to to have direct in, in terms, you know, join us. But if you got that chance, then we attach you with the experienced uh, engineers who then go with you and you see what happens and what they do. So as a company, um, I, I will say that we have developed a policy that then can be able to um, give you guys a chance. Um, in a quarter, in a quarter, we I, I always have a three, three internships, three interns, actually joining us so that then we can be able to release you guys back to go to school as we um, as we as we give other chances to other people. The longest I've ever, I've ever had for um, for second of a position was one year and this was this was a, um, a fine a, a final year student who was not waiting to graduate but we were able to stay with with him for the longest because of some unique characteristics that I saw in him. 
So it also depends on how you guys, uh, what you come with. Yes, we can give you the chance, but if it's going to be another another tour for you in the country, because you know we we, we operate across the country. If you are going to look at it in terms of getting per DMs to go out uh, and perform uh, and uh, do your work, or just having field trips, then the report that I will be getting from the engineers will determine whether I can be able to continue with you. Now, because you asked that question, I want to say this. Never should you take your experience of internship or attachment for granted. Why? Because that is where we as employers in this industry get our employees. We will release you to go back to school to finish school, but we will mark you for employment. So anytime you get a chance to, to, to be attached to any organization, please don't take it for granted. Use that time to, do, to give your best in terms of feedback, because the engineers that you'll be working with will be silently giving us reports about you. And then you will also be giving us reports about your experience in the field with the engineer you're working with. So this experience for us is what then gives us the kind of stuff that we have now, especially in the technical field. So as an organization, yes, we are now having this opportunity, but it is so saved because we are taking you on, uh, on, 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 the formal, on the formal engagement. You sign documentation, you sign confidentiality uh, uh, clauses, uh, we put you on a retainer, and you, you know we, we have you we have you as a normal staff. Only that now you as is from a specific period of time. Thank you, thank you so much. And maybe I will ask um, our other speaker, Dr. Jean Madete. Uh, most of us are normally advised that after finishing our degree level and a graduate level, we should at least get experience of one or two years before we. Uh, join before we join master's programs or any other, any other postgraduates. What's your take on that? Do you think it's very necessary for me to finish up my degree, work with Megascope, then do my uh, master's later, or should I just go direct after school? Can you advise me to do master's immediately? Thank you for that question. Um, it depends on the individual one, but also it depends on what experience you're getting. So some experiences is maybe you do one year where you're just sitting and doing uh, the same thing over and over again. Uh, it's better you go to study. So for example, I'll give an example of myself. When I finished my undergraduate, I felt like we did a lot of theory and we didn't, I didn't feel like I had hands-on experience. And when you're young and when you're still like living under your, your, you know, uh, your par with your parents, then doing voluntary attachment is actually good because you're not required to if you're not asking for a salary and also remember masters even you have to have the capability to pay for your masters so what i did i did an internship a voluntary internship with um, hospitals for almost six months and to me even that internship is where i met the people who eventually gave me employment and the people who eventually uh, made me pursue my further degrees yeah so doing masters immediately it's fine if you can afford it if you can get applications that's fine but doing an attachment opened my eyes and also focused what i needed to do in my life it focused uh, the directions i want to go it focused what masters i want to achieve and pursue so as i said it depends on who and um it depends on who the person is as an individual. It depends, uh, did you find a satisfaction in your undergraduate? Do you need to uh, investigate and find out more about what is out there? And uh, yeah, so like Matthew said, that internship or attachment, uh, even in your fourth year and in your third year, the ones you do are very important because they guide also your direction of focus and they, it can be your employment after you graduate also. Um, yeah, so that is my take. It depends on the individual and also depends on your finances and also depends on actually sometimes getting an internship is, you know, maybe you need to travel there, you need transport and maybe the internship doesn't uh, cover that. So that's those are things to look at as well. Thank you for the question. Um, I think we've lost you, Christine. 
Um, I'd like to ask a question to you, Dr. Jen. Um, <coughs> there are some universities that are in, okay, I don't know if it's the universities or the courses, there are some courses which have um, graduate assistance programs, I think that's what it's called, where you, you identify the best performing students and then after they graduate, they, they're given um, scholarship to pursue their masters as they work, um, I think as tutorial fellows under their lecturers. And then once they finish their masters, they are absorbed into working for the university. Is such a program available in Kenyatta University? Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, such a program is available, but we don't do it in the School of Engineering because the School of Engineering does not have the path of tutorial fellow. Uh, so that is what we are trying to develop a policy on. Uh, we've actually recently uh, recommended to the management that this should be uh, a pathway that we can follow. Another thing with us is, uh, for example, our department doesn't have a master's yet. So that's normally the issue. We can't, even if you take up a, a student, we can't guarantee that they'll have uh, the path of the master. So again, the policy that we're developing is ensuring that all departments have master's programs so that you can be able to do that. Uh, because if you if you're taken in as the tutorial fellow, actually tutorial fellow is after you have your master's, but if you're taken in as that, let's say graduate assistant, then you can't go and study somewhere else because you won't be able to be mentored by the lecturer. But if you if you already a tutorial fellow where you have your masters, then you can still be mentored uh, when you're doing your PhD, and you can be guaranteed that you'll come back. So yeah, so it's a uh, it's a it's something we're thinking about as a school because uh, it, it's very vital to retain uh, the best uh, you know the best in the area. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I'm seeing Alan is asking whether if someone becomes a tutorial fellow, does that mean they'll have to become a lecturer? Whatever it is that they go to study. Yes, they have. Okay. If you're taken in as a tutorial fellow, most of the time you're bonded by the university. So you, you're, you, the idea is you're the best. So we don't want you to go to your master's or your PhD and then you get absorbed somewhere else. So we want you to come back and become, uh, uh, you know, academic stuff. And normally most people who choose that path, uh, you know, remain to become academics. Um, yeah, but that is normally the case because uh, the university is investing in you and your, your smartness <laughs> and making sure that they can get you back in, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? As you wait for Christine. Now, um, Alan, I've seen your question, whether Megascope offers uh, options uh, like tutorial fellows for the industry. Now, ours is a service industry. So therefore, um, as uh, Dr. Badete would have you to lecture um, in, in the university, for us here, uh, when you have that knowledge, will actually require you to, require you to be hands-on in terms of um, um, servicing the equipment that you've been taught in, in class and actually um, working on the equipment per se to the level where they are functional. Now, as a, an organization, as a company, we are coming up with a training college. And actually, it's at, uh, it's at the advanced level of, of, of inception uh, where we have got all uh, the required licenses where we can be able to do um, you know, training for 
um, actually um, upscaling of your skills as you leave the university. Um, and it's going to be a, a regional organization that can be able to train um, you guys on, on the actual equipment usage. So this is, this is a venture that, um, that uh, Megascope is investing on. And uh, um, I'm actually, it's a note from the industry stakeholders. Uh, and once this is out, then um, having the, the tutorial fellows and having you guys coming to give your knowledge uh, to the students who will be enrolled for this, um, I know that time will, will be able to come and we'll be able to do the same. So as it is now, what we deal with as, as an organization is actual hands-on uh, service or that, uh, that you give to the hospitals that we'll be able to attach you to, um, that all the hospitals that we'll be able to call us for, for breakdowns. Uh, that will mean uh, actual um, actual hands-on experience with the equipment, the medical equipment that are there in the hospitals. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And I'm very sorry uh, I lost you guys. My internet became a little bit weak, but I'm back. And maybe I had a follow-up question to Dr. June about uh, academia. Dr. June, are there any necessary credentials or um, level of attainment in my degree uh, that will make me join academia? If I wanted to be a lecturer, do I have to have a first class, second class? Is there anything? Uh, is there any level of um, achievement that is needed for me to become a senior lecturer or yeah, to get into academia? Thank you, Christine, for the question. It would be nice if you enjoy the course. So people who enjoy the course normally attain the uh, most marks because you'll be doing it for the rest of your life. So if you do not enjoy the course, then academia, I would not recommend it. So we don't necessarily say first class, but uh, you need to have attained like at least a two one because that means that you are dedicated to the course that's one two with uh there was a new policy in kenya so you cannot get a permanent or senior lecturer level if you don't have a phd but you can be taken in with a master's but you're given like a one-year contract because every one year you have to prove that you're pursuing your phd so once you get your phd then your contract is changed from the contract to a more permanent position and then most of the time, if you have your PhD, you'll be a senior lecturer. You'll be a lecturer. If you have your master's, you are called an assistant lecturer. And if once you finish your PhD, you are apply for senior lecturer. And there's conditions that you need to fulfill. There's a whole list. I can't go through all of them now, uh, in, including supervising students, including uh, publishing, including getting grants for the university. And then from there, you can become senior lecturer. From senior lecturer, you have a few years as well to uh, amount to different conditions if you want to apply for assistant profession. But to become a permanent lex like um, permanent position in the university, you have to have a PhD now. Before it wasn't the case, but now you have to have a PhD. But you can be taken in with a master's and then uh, uh, as, assuming that you are still pursuing your PhD at the moment, if that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think that's clear for any school who wants to work. To this day, uh, mega scaling maintenance of equipment. Should we look forward to you guys scaling up into manufacturing? Because with COVID-19, we saw that um, Whenever such uh, situations come in, it will be every country for itself. Should, uh, are you guys looking into manufacturing? Are you guys looking into scaling up and how you can accommodate more biomedical engineers who are designers and innovators? I think the part, the first part of your the first part of your question, your internet was a bit uh, uh, disconnecting. But um, uh, your question is around innovation. Now. Um, no. You, re you realized you realized that your nature of industry is an industry that uh, you really have to keep uh, at par with uh, with daily technological development. 
Now, um, that then, um, you know, gets me back to your question. During COVID uh, period, um, you know, um, there was there was uh, there was an upside of equipment need, and you know, um, everybody, including Megascope, we were we were we were actually importing equipment because uh, equipment was needed in the country and elsewhere. Now, if uh, if you can remember, there was one student, I, I think, uh, who was able to invent um, um, an, an equipment that uh, that really uh, became the talk of town. And then there was also another gentleman who was able to invent uh, um, a, a stretcher, a bed, if I can use that 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 that, that term. Now. You, you, you see that this kind of unique skills got the attention of the industry players. And I think that is what we need for this country because um, uh, all we do now is import equipment because we don't have the capacity to, to make them here in, in the country. So we import them. But what we have done as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organization is that we have taken time to train our engineers, take them to, uh, for factory training so that then you can be able to see what really happens in the, in the factories where these equipment are done. And that for us is an investment that we deliberately uh, go to uh, with, with our staff members. We take you to the actual industry training so that you can be able to have knowledge. And if some of you are innovative, then there is room. There is room within Megascope where we can, we can, we can mentor. We can mentor some of you to come up with the equipment that, that, uh, um, that um, you, you want to make. I know my MD, my MD um, was actually involved with uh, uh, in, in trying to look at how we can be able to help that student who was able to come up with, uh, with, with equipment. And, uh, and the, the discussions around that, that student, I uh, know he's part of, he's part of uh, uh, the industry players who are keenly following the development of that student. So as an organization, I know we are inside. We, we are actually looking at how we can be able to support innovation, how we can be able to support you know, research work that you already do in the bio biomedical engineering. Okay, that's good. Do, do you guys have an R&D department? No, for now we don't have it because um, uh, because of the obvious uh, reasons of uh, what it takes to have such kind of uh, such kind of uh, investments. Um, we have some uh, some intricate. Uh, we, we have some some discussions that are going around in terms of having a plant here to um, to do some little bit of manufacturing that will be attached to the school of uh, the, the training school that I was talking about. But that is something that is still on the pipeline. Thank you so much. Then uh, we have a question on the chat from Alan Koetsch. I'll just read it out. I'd like to know why, uh, I'd like to know your opinions for both academia and industry point of view. Is the industry really ready for both policies on job description for biomedical engineering degree holders? I noticed during, he noticed during his attachment that uh, there was little differentiation between job done by the degree holders and the diploma biomedical engineers. I think he wants to know, does the industry know the difference in the job description between a degree holder and a diploma holder? Now, um, from Megascope point of view, how we differentiate these two people uh, is probably in terms of, uh, you know, the kind of skill set that you, the, the, the two of them come, uh, come with. I know that probably the degree uh, person, the degree uh, holder, is somebody who's gone through some more in-depth training on probably um, you know so, um, the actual equipment use, and there's a bit that the diploma holder, um, the level that the diploma holder still has to go through in terms of even um, the equipment. But then um, I hear what Koechi is talking about because when you come into Megascope and you're a degree holder and you're a diploma holder. I still send you to go and repair the same uh, anesthesia machine, for example. I mean, and I give you the same uh, um, the, the same um, uh, the tools to go and use. So, uh, therefore, what what I, what I need to know from Coach is does he does he uh, does he feel like um, the biomedical field um, should be very specific in terms of what the diploma holder needs to do and what the degree holder needs to do. Because at the end of the day, you guys, you're being trained by uh, Dr. Madete on the specific equipment repair and probably knowledge around the specific equipment that you, are, that you have in your hospital. That's what I need you to know. Because the job description for a biomedical engineer who is a degree holder and the job description for a biomedical engineer who is a diploma holder, in terms of the actual work experience you are going to have in the field there, is the same. An special machine is the same machine that you're going to work on. 
So should we have the degree holder, you know, probably being the policy section of uh, creating policies for, for, and we have the diploma holders, you know, doing the hands-on experience. I don't know what, I, I don't know what means by differentiating uh, the job description for the two. Um, uh, Koech, are you satisfied with the response? Uh, you. Sorry, you can continue. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Before Alan can um, respond, I would like to... This is actually a very big pain point when it comes to medical engineering in this country. Because, first of all, we don't... It's As you, as you alluded to earlier, it's all about servicing, maintaining, yeah? So even in Megascope, as you said, it's the same, you'll be given the same tools, you'll be doing the same role. Um, what we're trying to change uh, as, as, okay, and then Kenyatta University came in and producing degree holders, and they're going to the market. And it's really tough for us as uh, lecturers. I always like following up, I always ask questions. Uh, where, where are you working? Who, uh, you know, where, where are you best placed? So what we found out is, um the the graduates are not really satisfied with what is out there because they're not feeling challenged because as degree holders apart from maintaining we are engineers we like we like uh holding machines and as i said i had to go for an attachment because i felt like i needed to do that maintaining to understand that but we need to also remember that this diploma holder has had three years and the degree holder has had five years. And during the five years in school, they are being taught uh, policy making, they're being taught research and design. There's a lot of emphasis on research and design and development also. So uh, apart from the you know frustrations of the degree holders not having been challenged enough, I always challenge them. I'm like, come up with the solutions, come up with the, like once you go to maintain a machine, can you come up with a way that you can improve that process, for example? Go challenge your line manager and say, I have come up with this document that does this and this and this. And then they'll see your value. If you don't do that, you will, they will not see the value of your degree. If you just carry on with the job description, and because it's new to this region, it is upon the graduates who, with all the knowledge they have, to try and make a difference. I've seen it with very many of the graduates that have gone through the degree, and I've seen how they change the way the thought process um, is in the market when it comes to medical engineering. And even if it is just fixing and repairing, yes, maintaining, yes, but go outside the box, come up with a solution, and then the people will actually now differentiate between your education and the education of a diploma holder. But if you continue to do the same thing, it will continue to remain the same. So it's up to the graduates of medical engineering to show that change uh, in the market. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. I also want to add something to what Dr. Ria said. Um, and this is, this is something that is very practical in this industry. That um, you will find that many of um, the OEMs, you know, um, the, the, the actual manufacturers of this equipment, they will come for you. There's a question that uh, Christian asked about R&D. Now, many of these manufacturers actually have slots where they will want the kind of knowledge that you have. The, the hands-on experience that you, get, that you get when Megascope sends you to the field, the actual interaction with the equipment, you get to know them, and you get to challenge the performance of this equipment in the field. We get that feedback here several times, and I see emails from our engineers giving suggestions on how they, um, you know, they, 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 they have, they have, what they've done on the software, what changes they've done. They, and now those arguments can only come in when when we have into into thought what Dr. Ria just talked about. So so then if you go to the field as a degree holder, you have more knowledge, you are inquisitive, you want to know more, you want to make the machine perform better, then you are a candidate that can go to the manufacturer side. So that then you go and implement the software that, that is being placed on top of this equipment for better performance. So, so I mean, just like Dr. is saying, you have to challenge your JD. You, if, you're, if you're satisfied with the status quo of just maintaining and servicing the equipment, it's okay. But if the opportunity avails uh, so that you can be able to 
go deep into the equipment software and the equipment, um, 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 uh, I don't know what you call it, in terms of the topography of the equipment, then you can be able now to start even getting contact with the manufacturers. I also said here a few minutes ago that um, Metascope is looking at having a manufacturing plant here. And I remember in our opening, in my opening speech to, the, to, to, to my staff members last year, January, when this idea, um, the, the, when this information was put to us by IMP, I asked my staff members that will I be comfortable to look at the staff members that I have here and propose for employment in that in the in the R and D uh, um, or in the, in the manufacturing plant? Who am I going to employ in that industry? Are they going to allow me to float the advertisements outside so that I get uh, the likes of you guys to come in and work there, or will I be able to promote my engineers to go and work there? So I, I post that challenge to them, and I will even post it to you, just like the Kenya said, that we need you to be inquisitive. We need you to think through more than what Martin will give you as a JD, more than what the technical officer will be able to give you as a JD, so that then you can be able to enjoy and make yourself unique. You have to cut your niche in this industry, because the same equipment that diploma holders are going to handle is the same equipment you, the degree holders, are going to handle. So what would be your difference? Your difference is what exactly what Dr. Madetia said, and we will expect you guys to follow through so that then you are unique in your initial industry. Uh, thank you so much. That was very clear. And I hope Koech are satisfied and everyone on this call, you have to challenge yourself in your field. Don't just follow the job description. Uh, and maybe to comment on the fact that Megascope is going to have a manufacturing plant. Uh, whenever that time comes, uh, Mr. Matthew, remember here in KU, we have very innovative engineers. You can always reach out to us. Yeah. Or we can apply for those jobs because I believe many of us here are innovative. Um, maybe I'll ask. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Just a follow-up question on manufacturing. Uh, I can see Stella Chalagat has asked on the chat that, uh, do you have linkages to manufacturers such as employees go to be trained by the manufacturer of the medical equipment? Does your manufacturers? Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's clear. And she even commented that during her attachment, she observed the same. Uh, even me during my attachment, I observed the same. We got um, manufacturers like for Bella Vista ventilators, they came to KNH to train people. Yeah, I remember that. Yes, yes, Stella, thanks for that question. Um, um, I think what makes us unique is that we go for factory training. We take our engineers for factory training. We, we sponsor them to go to China, to go to you know, these, uh, where manufacturers are. Um, and even next week, next week uh, for Monday, we have one, uh, one professional coming in that is answering your second part of the question. We have one professional coming in here to train our engineers on IVD. So we, we invest so much on our students, on, on, on our staff members, so that then we can be able to keep abreast with the new technology that are coming in. You will realize with the hospitals where you've been working, sometimes equipment uh, are used and are placed in the stores. Why? Because spare parts are not available anymore, or the manufacturers are not availing spare parts anymore. So no, what happens to that kind of technology? It becomes obsolete, and new technology comes in. So how we can be able to keep uh, uh, the pace of the, uh, uh, with the new equipment that's coming in is when we bring the professionals to come and either train our people here or we take representation of our staff members to go for training with the manufacturers. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much for this thing. Uh, can, be able, can everyone be able to hear me um, or be able to see me? Yes, we can hear you, Ashton. Okay, thank you. Um, I will comment on the session so far. My name is Ashton, and I am moderating alongside Christine today uh, for this session. Um, I want to recap what has been said. Uh, Matthew Abongo, very early on this call, uh, commented about the CVs and resumes. Uh, it's sad to say that I don't have a five-page resume. <laughs> And I also know 
Do you have That's... one? Do you have one uh, with you? Do you have a CV? Let's start from there. Oh, I do have a CV. How many pages? One page. All right. And I'd like to say this, and I would want you to comment. The best CVs actually do occur as one page CVs. A CV that you can actually see all the skills and experience that a person has on the very first page. A lot of recruiters do uh, push away CVs with very many pages because of having to come through, um, you know, all all the pros and cons of uh, this person. I don't know if you do that. I do that a lot. Those 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 applications are always so many. So um, I will not really have the patience of looking at the so many pages that uh, you have, and especially if you are application letter. If your application letter is not on point, then uh, I would just imagine how your CV would look like. Unfortunately, that is what is happening in this industry, and therefore, probably you could even be the best for that position and imagine I've let you out. Yeah, so so... You, 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 must really, you must really try to have compelling statements, probably on your application letter or from your CV. And I know there are some of my colleagues who look at the CV and they don't look at the application letter because the application letter is always sometimes a messy also. So you lose a good candidate uh, based on the letter that they have written, while their CV could be the kind of a person you are looking at. So either of your documents, either of the two uh, instruments, you must be having compelling statements so that then if you find Matthew who looks at the application letter uh, before he looks at the CV, you still have a chance. If you find somebody X who is looking at the CV before they look at the application letter, you still have a chance. So the, the keyword here, compelling statements that are on point to what we are looking at. Remember I said functional CV. Uh, thank you so much for recapping that. Uh, having to write a targeted and functional CV, uh, not just chronological. I think that's a very key uh, skill that we as biomedical engineers need to have, and we shall certainly have to address that in our future sessions. Secondly, um, Dr. John commented uh, that we as biomedical engineers, um, are in the capacity of a degree holder, are actually not challenged enough. And I appreciate that uh, Mr. Matthew Abongo of Megascope has also mentioned that Megascope is actually planning to have a manufacturing plant uh, for a start. And uh, this is one way of challenging yourself as a biomedical engineer. And it's a good space you know, to get into if you have uh, uh, that innovative mind. And also that Megascope actually has a provision for biomedical engineers with their premises who are uh, curious and you know, ambitious to be able to join the manufacturing side of uh, their partnerships with uh, their suppliers or uh, within the same company. We do really appreciate that and we actually keep uh, tabs on you guys, <laughs> you know that. Um, there was a question on the chat section from Stella Chelagat, and it's actually tied to one of the questions that we are going to pose to you as the panelists, one of the panelists, Mr. Matthew. And this goes, being a major player in the industry, does Megascope plan to have you know, partnerships with uh, learning institutions to ensure a flow of skilled engineers? I mean, you have mentioned that you actually do accommodate engineers who are innovative uh, in the current uh, medical device industry. And you actually have future plans, uh, you've started on that, to have a manufacturing plant. I think it's actually uh, uh, in your good interest to you know, have that partnership with the learning institution to be able to ensure you know, that skilled flow of uh, graduate engineers, so you don't have to, you know, take up engineers, then train them again. Um, that is being sensitive to the cost uh, of that. If you understand the question, you could comment on that. Thank you, uh, engineer. Allow me to call you that. That's what I call my people here. Now, I, I, I don't think we can survive in this industry if we don't have partnerships with uh, the academic institutions, for example. Uh, I'll give you an example of what, what happened uh, about a week ago. 
Um, one of my staff members um, got an opportunity to go for further studies and probably uh, with one of my manufacturers. So there was a gap that was created. Now, what did we do? We never advertised, but we checked within our cycles to know whether we can be able to have somebody with the same skill set. And we are already um, you know, absorbing for that position. So that can only happen if you have partnerships with institutions. And just like uh, Dr. Ari at one point said, um, um, they keep on checking on where their staff members are uh, or where their students are. And they keep on checking on the progress of their staff members. Uh, and this industry is a very small industry, especially there are components within the medical field that have very few professionals. They know each other by name, where they're working, what they're doing, and they support each other. So through second of networks, we are able to get the skill set that you require, especially if it's a high skilled position that we need to fill, then we have to check within the, uh, the professional cycle where whether we, we can be able to have somebody with those kind of skills. So we have those networks. Um, about three years ago, I will tell you, uh, we were looking at uh, getting into a project, a city project uh, in the country, and we were pitching for it with the Ministry of Health. And therefore, we required a whole um, staff body for engineers who are city trained. So what we did, uh, uh, we had a partnership with uh, Kenya Medical um, uh, KMTC Training College, uh, Kenya Medical Training College, and, uh, and uh, we walked in there and we walked out with six students who are graduates, and they were all absorbed, and they were given contracts. They were given. They didn't go through the, the formal the formal interview process, uh, the, the, the actual rigor of the interview process. But it was a recommendation from the department, and they told us that go for go, go for I, I will use your names. Go for Alan. Go for Anthony. Go for Beryl. Go for Ashton. Go for you know Chantal. And we were assured by the department that these were the best. We absorbed them. We gave them letters of uh, letters of appointment. We gave them salary scales, and now they are working with us the last uh, you know for the last three years. So we were able to get that project to deal, I mean, with the Ministry of Health based on the capacity that we had in, 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 internally here. So we already have partnerships with institutions. I will not mind, you know, meeting Dr. Madete, um, um, but also extending that, this partnership with KU. So then when we need specific skill sets, I can confidently be called Dr. Madete and ask her if she has specific skill sets. So that then I don't go through the rigors of, you know, advertising and all that. Unfortunately, this then doesn't give the rest of you <laughs> the chance to competitively compete for some of these positions because Dr. Madeira is going to recommend for me one of you, and I will have her, him or her fill that position, and I will continue as an organization. So as much as we keep this partnership with the organization, I know you also you have to be competitive also in class so that Dr. Madeira can be able to identify with the kind of skills that you have for ease of uh, you know employability for you with the rest of the entire industry. There are so many of second of interest, uh, I mean, companies that uh, offer this service in the country. And therefore, I know Dr. Madeti is able to refer. So there's so many of you, even to the, some of the competitors that we have. So make sure you're the best, you give your best. Uh, I mean, work on your CV, share it with Dr. Madete. You never know who she can be able to talk to to give you a position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matthew. That was so insightful and encouraging, by the way. Um, the next question goes to Dr. June. And it's a direct question. What is the skill absorption trend in the medical device industry? You could It could be the academia aspect of it, or it could be the you know, the medical device industry uh, as a technical engineer. So I could tell you a little bit more information on that. Um, there are very many institutions that are producing um, medical engineers. Uh, the, uh, the, the base of engineers that are skilled right now is very wide, uh, but the market that is out there to absorb them is still one and the same. Uh, maybe you could comment on that. Uh, if you know uh, from your side uh, that there are measures being taken to uh, address this matter, you know, widen the market for biomedical engineers to be absorbed 
as they come out of the learning institutions. Um, yeah. If you have any information in that matter, yes. So the Association of Medical Engineers in Kenya is doing their very best to make sure this is changing. There is a policy uh, that is just needs to be launched. Uh, it's already been uh, decided on, on healthcare technology management and healthcare technology uh, in the country, and that we are waiting for, for the launch. So that includes all the team of service and what needs to be done from the ministry level. So that is something that is being actively being done. And I am an advocate for it, and I try my very best um, I, I, I know a lot of our graduates have got into companies as that before used to hire people from outside. They needed the degree level. And uh, I know training institutions as well. The ones which used to train medical engineers like KMTC and the rest. Because to train a diploma, you have to have a degree. So they used to have electrical engineers, mechanical engineers trained. But now they're taking our graduates because of the degree level. So they uh, build a whole uh, interest in what we can do and also try to avoid of, uh, I normally call it, reporting of uh, you know, the people we call uh, our degree holders. So we're trying our very best, especially I am, because this is something that was a pain for me. Because I came very many years ago with a degree and everyone was, basically everyone told me I'm overqualified for any job, and all I just wanted was a job. I was like, I can do anything. They were like, no, it can't be you. And it was very frustrating. Uh, but so I I consistently, every platform I go to, I try and encourage, especially our graduates, that you are vital, you are important. And also the policy makers, the Ministry of Health, the association, the clinical avenue, the, even the, clinical, um, the nurses and the doctors to appreciate the level of knowledge you have. So it's it's uh it's been a long battle, but I think we are getting there. And especially with COVID nineteen has made people appreciate our cost. And I think that's a very good step ahead. And uh, all my students make me so proud as how they are taking on the challenge and how they are showing their learning. And I think it's very important for us to make it because it as I said, we have graduated three, three classes. That is really we, um, the Technical University of Mombasa, their degree is very, very different from ours. Uh, so we can't compare it. Our degree is quite two. And then um, those are the only two universities that train medical degree level. And for the Technical University of Mombasa, it's not, it's not actually BST, it's BI, uh, BTEC. So I think when we go out there, it's a matter of showcasing that um, what you're training is as important uh, to the world than just having a but having an impact. I think that's what we should do. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dun, for giving information on that. Uh, there are more questions in the in the chat area. If you could direct your attention to that area, uh, there's one from IEEE Kenya. Uh, just for clarification, does it mean a functional CV drops things like hobbies, primary and secondary school education and achievements? Uh, what are the, some of the targeted statements to include in your CV? Uh, I think these ones are directed to Mr. Matthew. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Uh, just before that, there was another question for Beryl, from Beryl. But is it correct to include volunteer experience as part of your professional experience on your CV? Very yes, because if you don't put this now as a student, then what then will be on your CV? And uh, I remember I said that uh, even as you go through the volunteer experience, uh, what skill set do you learn from that experience? That is what matters. So that then when you go to an interview uh, and you're asked something, probably you are volunteering somewhere in Kenyatta Hospital. And you came, uh, you, you, you came in touch, or you, 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 um, you got some experience on uh, on, a, on a, an equipment that you that you never learned in, in school, or that you never learned about in school, and uh, probably a question from the panelists asks about that experience. Definitely, you learn to you learn to put it across. So uh, never underestimate at your level now. Never underestimate your volunteer experience. 
I know at the level of, uh, um, um, of experienced engineers, there are things that they would want to drop out of their CVs, like volunteer experience, because now they've already built experience, actual hands-on experience on their specific unique areas. So at your level now, uh, I, would, I would encourage that any volunteer work that you do that is in line with your professional. Remember that on the chronological CV, sometimes you have even, you have even gone to, to sell something, for example. You, uh, you, you are in a boutique somewhere and you sold something. Now, that can only be in a chronological CV, but now when it goes to a functional CV, there's no way your experience in the boutique will be related to uh, the, uh, the biomedical um, interview that you'll be going through. Unless there is a unique component, you, are, you, are, you probably want to be in, uh, uh, in, the sales, um, in, in the sales section of this company, for example. We have the engineers who are attached to the sales and marketing department. Their knowledge is quite key in terms of advising our client hospitals in terms of what equipment they can be able to sell. Now, if you if you acquired a specific sales skill that you think is very unique, that can be an add-on to the interview that you are doing, then please mention it and mention it targeted at what additional skill sets you can be able to bring to an organization. You know, we always ask our um, um, our candidates that what makes you unique. Now, what makes you unique here is really an add-on to the experience that Dr. Juna has given you in the class. So probably you went to a boutique and you learned something about customer service experience, and you want to use that experience to come and explain something. That apart from my knowledge in biomedical engineering, I can walk into a client facility and sell to them an idea about another equipment that they can have apart from what they're running. Now, you will be using your customer service experience that you learned in that boutique to win a client business. Now, at that level, I think that is now high level kind of interview where you really have to relate the unique experience, which is not biomedical related, to a biomedical field and you get the job. So many of us have done that. You, 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 you bring a far-fetched experience and you mold it in such a way that the panelist will be able to appreciate that experience and probably give you that position because of that add-on that you can be able to bring. The second question from IEEE, uh, does it mean in a functional CV you drop uh, hobbies, primary, secondary school level? Um, now, I want to talk about this specifically because you've mentioned them. And I would want to see this in the second page of your functional CV. Now, as Matthew, the reason why I will concentrate on your hobbies in the second part is hobbies speak so much about you as a personality. I don't know whether people knew that. When you tell me that one of your hobbies is playing football or you love football, do you know I might just ask you a question in that panel that will be related to that hobby? So let, let's, let's put hobbies that we can be able to expound on. If you tell me that you love swimming, I will look at the environment around swimming, for example, and ask myself that how would swimming help you as a professional to do what you need to do? Probably you swim in clubs. And in clubs, we have decision makers. We have stakeholders in these hospitals. So therefore, you will tell me the reason why you swim is because probably you want to network. Now, I will listen to that. So what I'm trying to say under hobbies here is, can we be able to put hobbies that we can be able to defend professionally? Now, if you tell me that you like, like cooking, for example, as a hobby, I will look at you, and you're a gentleman, for example. I don't, I'm not saying gentleman, you're not supposed to cook. But as a gentleman, when you tell me you like cooking, as, as, as a HR, I would, I would definitely bring a question on that. And if you're a gentleman, by the way, and you have cooking, for example, as, a, as one of your hobbies, expect a question from Matthew. I will ask you a question. Though. Because how is it related with your function, with the function that you're putting for me in that functional CV? Your primary school, your secondary school experience is quite key for me. Why? Because it gives me the kind of, the kind of uh, skill set that you've acquired. Biomedical engineers, I know you guys, you do a lot of mathematics and you do a lot of sciences. Is that so? But Ashton. Um, thank, thank you so much. much. Are you, are you there? I, I'm following yeah, up if uh, we are listening. I am. I am I'm listening. So I, I'm assuming you do a lot of mathematics, which is true. You do a lot of sciences, which is true. Um, you have background with physics. You have background with, uh, you know, the people who are going the IBD section. You have a background with chemistry. Uh, we have background with bi 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 biology. Is that so? 
very much so. So from, from the primary level, I would want to look at the correlation between your performance in primary level into your performance in the secondary level into what you're doing in the university. It doesn't mean that if you got, for example, the lowest grade in primary level, you went to high school, you got the lowest grade, and then somebody goes down to do a diploma course, you will be disqualified. No. We, we look at the consistency in terms of the skills that you have acquired and how you've also progressed in terms of your academics. So in functional CV, if you want to include this, then just know that somebody is going to interrogate your level, your, your, your academic performance in either of those levels. It doesn't mean, therefore, that if you performed badly in primary level, you, you now want to eliminate it in your CV. Definitely, we are going to ask you for your certificates and we'll still go through the various subjects that you have in the certificate. So as still as C grade uh, a candidate in primary level who gets a C in high school and you know does well at the degree level at the diploma level can still get employment just like a, a, a student but now i will go back to uh Kohit's question up there the difference between now the um uh, the degree holder and the diploma holder so therefore some of these things it's not just a matter of excluding them if you want to include them in the functional cv be ready to defend any questions that will come with that because the nature of the interviews that we do now is we interrogate you based on what is in your documents apart from the panel questions that we have by the way you know many times we have changed the panel questions and concentrated on you based on the documents that you've given us because probably we have seen something more in the documents you've given us more than the questions that we needed to ask you the conventional questions that we needed to ask you so be somebody who is well-rounded and who can be able to adapt to either the panel questions that will come or to the interrogation of the documents that you have presented. Your achievement is an amassed because some of the achievements that you've, 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 you've acquired in the field uh, comes as a result of probably the internship experiences that you uh, and, the, uh, and the attachment experience that you've, you've been engaged in. So please be including such in your CV. It is quite important. Uh, what are some of the targeted statements to include in, uh, in, in your CV? These are now the keywords. Um, uh, I will give you a hint, guys. Whenever you're applying for an elaborate job that has been described in any advertisement, look at the job description. And this is what I keep on saying. If the job description has 10 items that an employer is looking at, concentrate on the first five items. Five to eight items is what the questions are going to, uh, or what the experience is going to look at. If the job interview, or if the job uh, description has about five items, then look at the first three. Look, I mean, concentrate on that job description and build your statements based on what the job description say. Now, we are, we are talking about your fit as a candidate to that position. When you're inter interrogating your fit as a candidate to that position, you are actually looking at, I mean, answering yourself to what the job description is asking. For example, you're saying five years experience as one of, um, as the first probable um, uh, requirement in that job description. And you, you only have internship experience. So what do you do? The, the number two, number three, number four of the job description actually describes what, what you have. But the first one, it requires five, uh, uh, five years experience that you don't have. And you only have internship experience. What do you do? It is not bad to write in your application document that you have an internship experience that probably you can accumulate. You can say, I have two year cumulative internship experience. Now for me, when I see that, I already appreciate you as a professional who is still under training and I will be so objective and I can call you for an interview if you meet the other qualifications. So targeted statement here will come from the job description and look at the job description and try fitting into that job description. And don't just apply for any jobs because now you're desperately looking for a job and you want to just to send your documents um, every letter and center. So look at the targeted statements based on the job description that is there and answer to them. And um, probably another, in another session, um, after, if uh, Christian and uh, Ashton invite me, I, I, I will teach you guys on, uh, on CV writing skills and application letter writing skills. But I want to mention this here, that there, Matthew also has two ways of writing letters. You can do a suitability statement. A suitability statement is an application letter that qualifies why you're a suitable candidate for a position. Or you can do a value proposition letter. 
Now, you as students, the only application letter I would expect from you is a value proposition, where you say that as a graduate, I can be able to give value to your organization to this level. I don't know whether I'm making sense. So I would expect a value proposition letter where you are proposing value that you can be able to bring. And actually, if you go to that interview as a student now, or if you're, if you're applying for an internship or an attachment program, you need to exude value. What value am I going to get from you? Now, that value will be what Dr. Madete has taught you in class, which now you want to bring into the actual experience. So that will be, that will be another day that we can be able to go through that. And they're not, they're not very, very easy applications. You see an advertisement today, in the next 30 minutes, you've applied, you're sent. Honestly, Matthew is not going to call you. The reason why we always say that the deadline for this application is one month down the line is because we need serious applications. Is 10 days down the line is because we are giving you time to think through your applications. Do it today, don't send it. Go and rest, go and do your things. Come tomorrow, read your documents, and see whether your statements are exuding value for that position. Then send it. So these people will ask me a question, if the deadline is tomorrow and I send it one minute to the deadline, uh, uh, am I late? Probably you are the candidate I'm looking for. But probably you have also seen that application towards the deadline, so you are rushing to send it. But we are saying that the reason why an employer will give time period for any, for any advertisement is because we want you to take time to think through the kind of application you're doing. Whether it's an internship, whether it's real time, we want you to think through. So you'll do statements of suitability, you will do suitability, uh, you, you'll do um, a value proposition statement that then will be able to single you out. And for me, I am a lover of serious applications and I will look at your documents if it is something like that. So um, I, I, I don't know whether I, I've been able to answer your questions um, uh, appropriately. Yes, yes. very comprehensive. Thank you so much. I also think um, the area of personal, personal branding and selling yourself as an engineer is very, very important for communicating your science and putting yourself out there for employment and such. And, and therefore, I think it's a very key area and has to be handled uh, in a very critical manner. And we'd like to also have you for a session in the future uh, to our work. I would like us to continue the session and continue with the uh, Thank you so much, Ashton, for heading that session. Um, there's another question from Chantel Were on the chat. Uh, uh, Mr. Matthew, can you see it? I'd like you to respond to that because it's also concerning the industry. The ones I talk about while on attachment. I interacted with a service engineer and he emphasized that more males are taken into the industry as compared to female because of flexibility. I think I also went through the same. I've also been told the same. Um, it, it's a very unfortunate, uh, it's a very unfortunate uh, scenario that uh, um, um, the female professionals are facing this industry. Uh, I, I, must, I must bring my reservations for this. I must be very careful on how I'm going to handle this question. And um, I will tell you for a fact as an organization, Megascope. Um, we have had three female engineers. Uh, one of them uh, left uh, when she went for further studies. I still have two. So the question I keep on asking myself is, why is Megascope not attracting so many female employees? But I want to throw back this question to you guys. Do you guys feel, well, Christian, you'll allow me to think through how I'm going to answer, answer this question. Do you guys feel like this industry is a man industry? I'll tell you the reason why I'm asking this question. Because even with the two lady engineers that I have in Megascope, we have never been selective in terms of where we send them. But for my office, I will sometimes intervene when a breakdown happens in a remote locality 
where I cannot send a female engineer. I will tell you for a fact, we have equipment all over the country, even into the remotest of the parts of this country. But the female engineers that I have in the company will feel a little bit, you know, um, a little bit, uh, they, they will find it not easy to go to these remote areas. Now, if an employer knows this about such professional, then we tend to shy from employing female employees because we will only recommend them to go to, you know, near places and uh, places that are looked as as habitable. So I want to challenge you guys. The industry where you are in, if you come to work with organizations like Megascope who have equipment up to Polar, up to Wajir, up to, you know, the remotest part of this country, you must show interest that you can be able to go and service an equipment in that place and come back. So the emphasis, therefore, in terms of flexibility will be there because we feel men will be able to take up these challenges without questioning. And then number two, something I need to challenge you, uh, ladies, many of you come to this employment without driving skills for it now. Now, our nature of company is that we assign our engineers vehicles to go out. I don't know if you've seen some of them come to KU. They drive Megascope vehicles to go to the field. Now, I give you a car as one engineer to go to Holland. And you are Christian. You should drive yourself to Holland. So you need to come with driving skills and be ready that we can be able to send you anywhere. Yes, sometimes in remote, remote places, we send you accompanied by other engineers. But we need the challenge to also come from you, that you can be ready to take assignments anytime. And therefore, we will be able to absorb you as it is. Otherwise, what I see in this industry is that many of uh, many of our professionals, um, um, the, the female professionals, they they will they will go through biomedical training, and then when it comes to actual hands-on experience, they will come in for a, a, a short period of time, then they will change professions. They will come away from biomedical engineers and they go to do something else. So um, that's the kind of challenge that you're having as employers. And it's something that also I would ask Dr. Madete also to help us. As we partner with you guys, we also need you to be hardened up because uh, this industry is quite challenging and uh, it requires you people to be like it. Nice. Uh, thank you. Um, I think you, you a good job, Matthew. I know that's normally the hardest question to answer, especially when it comes to uh, that area. Um, when working with emails for me, I have found that you need to not see, don't see, don't assume. And I'm always... Okay. 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 okay, give me a second. So, uh, is it better now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, no, I was just saying that with, with, with females, you just um, shouldn't see it. Um, I always say it's not like, if, if the better person to be hired is male, it's fine. If a better person to hire the CV says driving license, it's fine. But never see the, the gender. If you see the gender, especially when it comes to engineering, it makes it hard and it make, makes it very hard for HR. So that's what I'm saying, Matthew. <laughs> I understand your predicament. Uh, but it's your qualification. It's what you've done. And as female engineers, we need to be very, 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 very adamant in how we work. And we shouldn't be, oh, it's because I, I am not flexible. No, 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 no. They shouldn't see that. So we shouldn't be able to give them that. We shouldn't be able to say, I am I am not flexible. Um, I have. Oh, my whole career, I have never seen myself because I had a very good mentor who told me what is on the paper, what can you deliver, what can you do, and is it different from what a man can do? Is it different from, like, because you have children, you can't do something? No, 
uh, because you uh, you want to you know do something different. No, it shouldn't be about that. It should be can you deliver? If you can't deliver, you can't deliver. If you can't deliver, you can't deliver. So if you look at the aspect of gender, then if you also if you don't as a as a female if you don't apply because of gender if you don't if you don't oh I I, I don't want to apply to my gospels because they'll make me go to Ajir. That's the fault. It's not about megascope it's if, if you are if you're qualified to do it um you should be able to get the job and you should be able to deliver and you should be able to do the job if you don't do the job they will let you go and hire someone who can so it shouldn't be about the gender so thank you thank you matthew for delicately uh, approaching that subject thank you thank you thank you so much for those authentic responses and I hope all the ladies in the call, your eyes have been opened and will be willing to take up challenges. I also believe the same. We should not wait to be given opportunities because you're female, but you have to prove that you can actually uh, perform the role or do the task. Um, Dr. Jun, I'd like us to talk about scholarships, mostly postgraduate scholarships. Um, majority of people here maybe are from Kenyatta University and even other universities. Does KU have programs that can help us in applying for scholarships? For example, if I wanted to do a scholarship, can I be helped by the school to get a good university and also just maneuver through the whole process? Uh, scholarships are hit and miss, uh, but there is always room to get scholarships. There's always applications you can do. Um, one, what I do whenever I get an opportunity for the same, I always forward to all my previous class reps. Um, if there's any in this call, they'll attest to that. Um, they they come from different uh, uh, organizations, different vicinities, so it depends. Kenyatta University, the problem is we don't have a master's. But uh, for example, the Department of Energy is the only one in the school which has a master's, and you can get what we call the National Research Fund um, to assist you in payment of most of the activities that are involved. So these avenues you can go to. There's the DAD organization. There is, you know, quite a few organizations that assist Kenya as well, um, that assist with funding when it comes to masters and uh, progressive uh, learning. So there's always opportunities. It's just to find them. Sometimes it's difficult. I'm good at finding them. So if there's any question on how to find them, then that's a different question and that's something that I need time to gather, but there's always opportunities. Thank you. Nice and thank you so much. And to add on to that, um, do we have access or if I try to do my project in Kenya, do I have access to the national uh, laboratories or resource centers like Cambry and many others? Can the school help us? or connect us to such laboratories if the university doesn't have the resources to do my practical? Yes, the access is very much possible. All that the university needs to do is have a discussion or a member MOU or an MOA if a MOU is already present. And that normally is done a lot, especially when it comes to research, because you can't have everything in our institution. So that is always possible. You just need to request it, and it needs to be approved, and that's normally, it's done a lot. We are actually doing a project now with Kenmi Sumo, and that is what we did. We have to ask for the approval, and it, if it's approved, then the good thing be between parastatals, it's not a big issue, but you have to have the request done first. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that response. And I can see from the uh, from the chat section, we still have questions. There's a question from Stella again. Uh, what does it take to excel in the industry? And does growth in the career stroke corporate ladder depend on the results you are bringing or the number of uh, the number of years of your experience? I think this is directed to Mr. Martin. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be very straight on this. That your growth in the career uh, field will depend on both. Now, you could come into Megascope and within uh, the first appraisal period of time, uh, we realize that you're a performer. If an opportunity arises for leadership in that, uh, in that department, then definitely will be considered. 
Now, you'll be here for 10 years plus, and what we are seeing from you is not results. You're just here to draw salaries, and you're comfortable. You know, there, there's no drive that you have. Then there is no way you know, anybody is going to promote you. So therefore, just know that as you come out to the career, um, to the industry, just know there's something we call appraisals, and appraisals is based on your performance. After every period of uh, period, uh, probably six six weeks, six months, or uh, one year, we look at your performance with uh, the head of departments, and you know we take you through um, a session where we can be able to know how you performed. Your growth then will depend on the appraisal processes and uh, the kind of performance that you bring. So uh, the number of years here is uh, uh, probably um, related to um, the appraisal period that you've done and the kind of results that you bring in. So what you need to concentrate on is during the appraisal period, exactly what have you been able to do that can be able to single you out uh, among your peers. Um, thank you. I hope that's very clear to you, Stella, and everyone else. And there's another question from Alan. How ready is the industry for young and new innovation made locally, both on policies around innovation as well as industry acceptance of these innovations over the imported equipment? Uh, and that is both on academia and industrial perspective. How is the industry ready to absorb our new technologies that we're making here in Kenya? Or maybe to make the question more direct, uh, Megascope is selling an example ventilators from Bella Vista or any other company and Kenyatta University is making ventilators. How open are you guys to, yeah, to buy from us or to deal with us? We all know as engineers that uh, um, your equipment must go through certification and the rest. Now, the moment the equipment passes through the certification and the quality assurance and all that, and uh, the user, who probably in this case is KEMSA or is a private institution, is ready for the brand that you've, uh, you've, um, you've innovated, then as an organization, if that proposal comes, or if we do a pitch for that specific equipment, let's call it KU ventilator, for example, and the KU ventilator passes through, um, you know, the, 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 um, the, I don't know what you guys call them, you, you know, the certification processes, uh, quality checks, and they're able to do uh, what needs to be done, then we don't have any options but to get them. Now, the reason why I said that we are keen on having a manufacturing plant here it's because we want to give room for our locally manufactured equipment. And probably is this going to be the first one in the region, then let Megascope take the credit for. So that means then we are ready as an organization to have this rollout, but is the market ready for the locally manufactured uh, equipment? It will depend on the certification that will be required, uh, the standards that will have to be met, and probably the quality uh, uh, issues that will have to be addressed before the equipment manufactured by KU can be able to get into the hospitals. Remember, uh, there is no trial when it comes to life issues. It's either we get it right or we mess it up. So uh, uh, if KU can be able to invent, then as a service industry or a service company, then we'll have, to, we'll have to convince, we have a sales department here, we have to convince the user that the equipment made by KU is the best when it comes to this line of, um, um, of, of treatment. Um, nice one. Dr. June, what's your take on that? Um, thanks, Christine. I think, uh, can you hear me every time I go to this? Uh, uh, your voice is a little bit lower again. Okay, for me, um, as you know, Christine, it's always about documentation, documentation, documentation. When it comes to research and development, if you document everything and you follow the correct steps and especially medical devices. It's not like making a shoe. It's not like making a, a cloth. There's so many steps that needs to be followed. So for me as an academic is to make sure I am training my students to understand that it's not about Juakali uh, when it comes to medical devices. Even if it's Juakali, it still needs to go through verification. It needs to be validated you need some clinical data before it's used in the market so as megascope they need that documentation they need to see that you have clinical data that you have uh, done everything and for them if they see that you 
gone through that certification, you have your marks that you require, then it shouldn't be a problem. It's the uptake of locally manufacturer, manufactured equipment is always doubted because people try and do shortcuts. And if you don't do shortcuts and you get the right marks and you get the right certification and you get it working perfectly, it would not be a hard sell because a company like Megascope does not mind selling Kenya. But if you sell Kenya and it's wrong, then Megascope will be blamed. So if you have it right, and especially medical devices, I always emphasize on this. If you have it right and you follow the right steps, it should not be a problem to sell it to Kenya. The reason that it looks like we don't uptake Kenyan things is because people take shortcuts and you can't do that for medical devices. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I love those responses. And I can agree with you that even if it's not medical for anything to sell in whichever place, it has to be of high quality. And in the um, in this call, if that, uh, any student here trying to innovate anything or coming up with any device, take your time to do a lot of research and uh, make sure you have your mentors and everything, every resource that you need so that you can come up with a very unique device and also a device that you have designed with the human, uh, human centered, like the human in mind and making sure it's very safe. Thank you so much for that. And I can see from the chat section, the topic on self branding has drawn a lot of attention. There's, uh, there are more questions on the CV, I, uh, on the CV and I think you can just respond to them, Mr. Matthew, and we can organize to have another event for self-branding uh, in particular, especially for engineers. There's a question from Churchill. He's asking, um, is it important to include computer packages and driving on educational background? And another one from Anthony. Anthony Gitau wants to know, how do you know which CV you should share with when applying for a job? Because you've given us two types of CVs, so which is which? Which one do I use at which time? Thank you. Uh, let me start with Anthony uh, in that order of the question as they came in the chat. Now, how do you know which CV? I said uh, when you're applying for a job, um, you are looking at um, the job description, the advert. So for me, therefore, that just tells me that you're going to send a functional CV. Unless you are looking for a job and you're not very really sure whether Megascope has any positions, that is when you send the chronological CV, where you have everything. But even if we did that everything, there must be an emphasis that you are a biomedical engineer somewhere. So, uh, uh, but Anthony, uh, um, if, it's a, if you are in response to a job advert, then for me, uh, it will be given that you'll be sending a functional CV. Or if you want to send your chronological CV on a specific job advert, then you must you must be very care, you must be very keen on the kind of information that you give it, you give in there. So uh, I think we, we can be able to get another session for that. But for now, uh, let's let's look at both the functional CV and uh, the chronological CV. On the question on uh, uh, education background from uh, Kiplagat, um, my question to you is, do you understand what education background is? If you do, then you realize that education background is probably synonym to academic background. Now, which one is academic and where do the rest fall? Now, from my understanding, the rest falls under professional training or professional background. So where you have computer packages, you have accounting, where you have uh, uh, is driving skills, even uh, that, that's, a, that's a professional, it's, it's a professional uh, enhancement. You, you, you professionally trained yourself on how to drive, but really they cannot fall under academic or education background. They are both, they are, they are, they are professional, they are professional training and professional courses that you attended. So if you're supposed to put them in a CV, then you want to create another section and a professional background or professional training or short courses that you undertook that then will be able to enhance your skill set where they are needed. I don't know whether I'm clear on that. 
So we just need to understand, we just need to have a clear distinction on what academic or, uh, or education background is. If you understand that, then the rest of those training and the short courses that you go through will be under professional training back. Um, yeah, I think I think those are the two questions uh, that are related to the CV, as I can see. Yeah, I think you might have anything to add. Maybe to add on that, I am not a HR person. I, I respect you guys a lot. <laughs> but there is one thing about my CV. There is a CV I send if I'm applying to Europe. If I'm applying to Kenya, it's different. That's, I'm just giving an example. Ah, yeah, the CV that I will apply to Megascope and the CV that I'll apply to KU are completely different. Like, it doesn't, the words even don't look the same. <laughs> so I think what our young ones, uh, our young ones, wow, our, our students need to understand is be specific. Don't send your CV to everyone the same. Don't. Look at the job description, the way Matthew has done it. Uh, get someone to read over it, because typos sometimes we, we, we forget, or uh, the way words are, sentences are put. And I like what Matthew said. Your application letter and your CV are so important. If there's something that is there that is not meant to be there, remove it. Uh, when you're applying for academia, talk about your academic experience. If you're applying to industry, talk about your industry experience. You can't have just the same. Uh, it's hard when you're just graduating, but if you are just graduating and you helped in a lab session, you um, assisted in training, so on, so you, you did this training and you did this training, put that. Uh, if you're applying to industry, you put things like um, I'm, I'm, my, my project, all the projects I've done, all the attachments I've had. Uh, for academia, we don't really want to know that. We just want to know if you can train or you are good at standing in front of people. In the industry, they know if you're good with a spanner. Uh, so it's completely different. And you can have both uh, in your five-page CV, but you can use them to two pages depending on the application, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, thank you so much. And th there's something I want to seek clarification on. Uh, it's not a very important thing. It's also concerning application writing, especially the letter. I remember when we were applying for attachments, I had drafted my letter and one of the components, I had included my, um, what is it called? My GPA. Then a friend of mine goes through it and tells me it's not necessary for you to show them what you uh, your GPA or your transcript at this level. After all, it's just an attachment. It's just an internship. What do you think? Should we include or is it not necessary? Just me remember somewhere in my uh, initial statements, I said the same way you treat a formal application when you're out of school should be the same way you treat an internship or uh, a detachment pro 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 uh, program. Why? Because that is where we tap our skills set. So there is no way, if you feel you are, what did you call it? GPA or something? GPA, yes, yes. Yeah, if you, if you think like your GPA would be, would be, would be the catchy point for this HR who needs to give you a position, please put it. You know, the reason why? Because probably from that point, somebody can be able to know the kind of internet that is. Probably from your transcript, somebody can be able to see hope in terms of um, um, an innovator in the making. So um, for me, the internship program that you people, you're going through should be as intense as the energies that you put in when you're applying for a formal employment. So never, let, let's not take anything for granted. I mean, the reason why I will call you after your school is because of the opportunity that I gave you in Megascope. And I saw how you work based on the documentation that you gave me. Now, if those documents don't even come, and you also don't get the attachment, then who has benefited? So um, unless unless you feel like your GPA points are, are probably low, and, uh, and the, the, the HR is going to employ you uh, is laying emphasis on higher scores in, in, your, in your points, uh, then, then that is different. But then at the end of the day, you still need a job. So what do you do with your lower points? You still pitch for them. You still pitch for the position and 
pray and hope that you get a chance to come and defend yourself. Because at the end of the day, sometimes some of us are very poor in documentation. But if you're given a chance to present uh, before a panel, you actually exude some value more than even somebody who has a very perfect document who cannot be able even to talk uh, or defend their documentation. So there must be a mismatch. I know sometimes some of us are very good in spoken English. Some of us are very good in written English. And if you're given a chance to speak, like in you engineers, I know uh, some of you are very good with the machines. But if you're told to speak English, the kind of English that some of you speak, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we see them even uh, uh, the kind of emails that we see some of you write. Uh, you will ask yourself whether uh, this student passed through Dr. Madete's uh, hands, or did Dr. Madete just keep quiet and just give them the practical experience without saying any any English? You see, so we understand you guys, and we know some of you are so technical that the actual presentation becomes an issue. But then we will still be very patient to listen to the little English that you can be able to speak to defend yourself. So, uh, so for me, please, there is no documentation that you can leave because either they're not making sense in that internship application, or for you, you feel like this is too much information to be giving to the problem and, and, and well. Well, nice, and thank you for clarifying on that. Maybe um, as we approach the closing of this session, I'd like our speakers to have some parting shots, just uh, leave us with some insightful remarks after all this wonderful um, wisdom that you've given us here. Maybe a word or two from each and every one of you, then we'll close our meeting today. Maybe we can start with Dr. June. Um, I think you, oh, sorry, I, okay, I'll hold again. I think it's important to appreciate your learning because it's been five years. <laughs> but after those five years, the rest of your life is long. Even Matthew can attest to that. The rest of your life is very long. And you need to get the good foundation. So when you're in school, get the foundation of especially networking, learning how to do the emails, uh, I hate emails which are, there's no, there's no dear, it's just a sentence. And I'm like, uh -huh. or uh, summarizing of, uh, please find attached PFA. You can do that once you've got the job. But before you get the job, don't do PFA, don't do summarizing, don't do acknowledge the person you're sending the email to. I'm glad you mentioned that, Matthew, because sometimes I'm just like, oi. And you learn that from when you are not, there's no consequence of it and you master that when you are in undergraduate and i think i was taught that by my supervisor then and i appreciated that because she used to tell me what what email is that you sent to me i didn't because it was not well written uh you harm your skills when before you get employment because employment that one sentence email can get you fired uh, when you're in university, you don't have the job yet, or when you're doing attachment, you don't have the job yet. So you harm those skills before you graduate. But I like that you're doing these sessions. I like the way the IEEE I, uh, Kenya branch is trying to acknowledge the skills that are needed, trying to get to the professions and understanding that. And I, this session, um, I think Christine sent me the email. I, I replied immediately. I'm like, yes, because it's never, people, they, they assume uh, my degree will get me the job. No, there's so much more to just graduating. And I'm glad you guys are doing this and big ups to all the team that is involved in this. And um, I'll encourage you that once you've harmed all the things that you need to harm and asking the questions, I'm glad that uh, you have engineer and someone in your life. He was my mentor as well when I came to KU and he helped me to navigate through some of the, um, we call it bureaucracy or red tape or all that and how to write a memo, how to speak to a profession and starting at your foundation is very, very important. And it's never, it, you should never assume um, everyone is in the same wavelength just be professional throughout and the professionalism throughout gets you places i can say now i have learned so much from matthew as i said hr is amazing i've learned so much i've understood so much i've i've gained knowledge even when i know i am working um even when like even how to advise uh, students how to advise people who are trying to get into the market things that I didn't know. And 
always, always, always be prepared to learn because don't ever assume that I have done it all. I am a, I am a degree graduate of medical engineering. You should recognize, no, just assume nobody knows who you are, especially when you do an application. Don't assume they know. Assume like that, that question about GPA and transcripts and all that. Don't assume, um, especially when you believe it's something that can big you up. Um, there are some CVs which have pictures, some don't. There are some uh, jobs you go to where you are, you are headhunted and you arrive. And especially the headhunting ones, I have had that experience of don't just go and say, I'm here, go prepared, go prepared, be professional, and just do exactly the same whenever you are approaching an organization, whether it's an internship, an attachment, or um, or you have been headhunted, or you are applying to an uh, international organization, or you are applying to an organization which just started up. Just be professional throughout. And that transition of professionalism starts from your foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. June. And also thank you for joining the call with us today. And we'll always continue to get nuggets of wisdom from you because you are always here with us in school. And I'll encourage all of us to try and make value and interact with our different lecturers, Dr. June and many others, to get these insightful um, comments and advice. As you can see, Dr. June has a mentor who is engineer Zomo, so it's very important for all of us here to have mentors too. Because mentors guide us from um, zero and they help you climb the ladder up. So thank you so much, Dr. June, for joining us today. And let's hear from Mr. Matthew. Uh, thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, I'm just laughing at uh, some of the comments in the chat. Uh, um, Somebody is saying that English is very hard and the uh, engineering team must should invest on tools for grammatical checks and all that. Um, the tool that you can invest on is your peer. When you work on your document, uh, don't be shy to share with uh, somebody to just check check it out for you. Uh, Ashton, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're saying the art is very hard anyways. Um, it is never easy. Welcome to the world of, uh, of professionals. Uh, you've taken your time, five years to be trained uh, on this, and therefore, that means as much as the art is very hard, uh, I know you are Lua, and if Lua's are in the house, they can know what this guy is talking about. Uh, if, if you know art is hard, then you you have been prepared by Dr. Madete really to handle it, the, the hardness of the art. Eh? So, uh, welcome to my world. It's never been easy. Uh, you think like you have it all until you walk out here and you realize that the people who you need to work with. That's the reason why Dr. Madeta at her level, she still has a mentor. So walk out having mentorships uh, that can be able to work with you. But never give up. Never give up. That's the reason why you're being you're being you're being trained to be the best that uh, the, the world has. Uh, so um, as as my parting shot, I was laughing to that. Um, as my parting shot, I, I I want to leave you with um, with, uh, with uh, yeah, observations. Institutions like um, KU have in initiatives that are going on, and I've listened to actually, you know, mention some of them. And one of them is what I've seen uh, uh, your team has uh, has uh, has organized, what you're calling um, 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 motivational talks and something like this. I know of institutions that have career weeks, and probably from interaction with Christine, she was telling me that you have such, you know, uh, periodically. Now, when you invite the likes of Matthew, the likes of Dr. Madete, to come and talk to you. I know there's some guys that you still feel in you. You know the how, and uh, from your questions, you can you can still you can still feel that question. How then do I pitch for this job, or which job do I apply for? Uh, uh, today, everybody is going to the newspapers and all that. Do you think all those jobs that are in the newspapers uh, um, uh, um, have, have not been filled? And I will tell you for a fact that in, in the HR practice, uh, practice we, we, we've, we've, we've been instances where we only place those jobs on the papers for audit purposes. You know that. While in the real sense, we have already employed our head practice. So for audit purposes, especially for government positions, which will be audited on how Dr. Madete was given that job, 
you will realize that we will place that advert there to cover ourselves when the audit work comes. So, so you, you must be very competitive. And I agree with Mr. Nyango, Engineer Nyango. I mean, the art is really hard, my friends. This, just go and ask him what he means by that. The art is really hard. So the how here is how you pre prepare yourself for this. So this career week, uh, you know, your leaders will be able to prepare them. But then, really, how then do you present your competition? How then do you present your, uh, uh, your, your brand? Internship placements that you, you're talking to me about, you are increasingly placing a huge demand uh, uh, to, to KU, uh, that the KU should be able to get for you internships. And there's an increase in, number in, in, in terms of the number of student population that is looking for this position from all the colleges around. And I heard from Dr. Madete that both you and, uh, both you and, uh, is it, um, did you say technical university? Or what? what did you call it? You're the only two uh, institutions that are producing graduates, but, uh, but, uh, degree holders. But then ask yourself, how many of you are churned out in every year? So while internship programs are good initiatives towards building your employability quality uh, as a student, these programs can only di uh, directly assist uh, uh, just a, sm a small percentage of the student population. Because we cannot be able to have the 50 of you in that class to come to Megascope to get the experience here. So we need to competitively you know, look for opportunities to do internships in organizations that can be able to absorb our skill sets. And lastly, I just want to have um, an encouragement um, uh, to Dr. Marete that we, you need to have to, to probably have those in-house career advisory services uh, or what, what I would call student-centered uh, career programs that can be able to help your students tackle some of these issues. So I know some institutions have career advisors that, uh, that, that help students go through the uh, career guidance um, and uh, I will tell you for a fact that uh, many employers are grappling we the fact that they are half the the, the graduate that are half baked half baked in the sense that uh, um, 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 the kind of competence that they have the kind of efficiency that you'd expect from a student the kind of innovation that uh, that you'd expect a student to 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 demonstrate would be disappointing at the end of the day so dr madeta gives me a recommendation of one of the students that I assume is the best according to according to the performance class. But then when they come to the actual performance, then I find I am disappointed in the kind of competence that I would expect from this uh, kind of a candidate or kind of a student, even after taking them through the manufacturer's training. Efficiency, we are looking at efficiency here. We are looking at um, um, being, uh, taking uh, initiatives to do things. So the reason why employers will complain about how have big graduates and um, this narrative is running around you know in the country in the region is because sometimes the employers teach it that at the end of the day yes you walk in with a very good document you walk in with a, a very good presentation that you know what uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the best that you need to be able to make this job but when you come in there is a level of complexity that you need to see you relax and you feel like you get into you get into the company politics and that then sucks you up, sucks the energy that you have. Because every company, by the way, has politics. Megascope also has its politics. But then how do you single out yourself? That you know what? As much as there is this politics that now I'm involved myself in, I have a professional being to build. I have a brand to build. So, um, uh, uh, dear colleagues, I, will, I just want to leave you with that, that you need to ponder through it. That the job market, as you transition from big even pocket money to come to look for that pocket money, it's a different world. So as you walk outside there, make sure that you know that from, from the, the, the time Dr. Madete releases you to the world and they give you powers to do the that pertains, just know that now you're joining the world where you are expected to give your very in terms of the performance. So, so thank you so much for this opportunity, Christian and the team. Thank you so much for just inviting me for this to give my uh, little new understanding to you guys. I know I respect you guys so much because you're the guys with the kind of knowledge that you need in this industry. And we are looking forward to working with you. And I look forward to having one of you join us, or the many of you to join us here in Megascope to work with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. M much gratitude to you, Mr. Matthew, for joining us today. I respect him of your busy schedule. And we are also happy and very fulfilled this morning for gaining so much wisdom from our very own Kenyan competent 
uh, people in the industry. And we look forward also to gaining much knowledge and much skills so that when you come outside to the industry, we might be of value to the companies. We, mu we must give value to the companies so that you can also gain personal satisfaction and also serve the nation. In Aichipoli, we normally say that um, using technology to serve humanity, and I'm very happy that most of us here chose biomedical engineering because it's di directly related to medical and serving people. That's all. Thank you so much. And I'd like Ashton to give a vote of thanks. Then I'll close the meeting. Thank you, Christian. Um, and the panelists today, Dr. Dr. June, June, Mr. Mr. Matthew, Megascope, are very really grateful to have you today and any other day. I'm not a panelist, but I want to give a parting shot. My key takeaway today was that, you know, you actually need to brand yourself as an engineer. You're not just a technical person. You also actually do represent the company when you go out there, when you are sent out into the field. So before it actually gets to that, you know, you need to actually get the job and you need your brand to do that. So I have learned that you actually uh, don't use a generic CV for that. It needs to be targeted and functional to the specific role that you're applying to. Uh, secondly, um, you actually need to review your CV, either yourself or uh, you give it to a peer to go through it to, you know, see things that you actually don't see uh, in your CV. And thirdly, uh, thirdly, that, you know, the HR persons actually do, you know, come through a lot of CVs and resumes and applications. And it's actually nice to use catchphrases and catching statements for that. So I think I'm grateful for that. And we should have a session for that in future and have um, Mr. Matthew with us. And of course, at his convenience for a future session. Otherwise, I'm supposed to give a vote of thanks, and I'm just grateful that we held this session today to the panelists and the attendees that are here today, and to my fellow moderator, Christine. I'm grateful that this was a success, and I wish you the very best with your endeavors today uh, through the weekend and a very fruitful week ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know all of us have gained much, and as Alan said when we started the session, every one of us had a notebook, or if you are storing it in your mind or your brain, well and good, but I know we have all benefited, and we have all gotten the fundamental tips that we need, and I know the future is very clear, it's very, even though Ashton is saying that the earth is hard, it all depends on how you approach life and how you approach obstacles. Yeah, just have faith and do your best. That's what I believe in and be competent in whatever you're trying to do each and every day. Thank you so much to our panelists and we look forward to interacting with you again and again. Thank you so much. Uh, the session is over. So all uh, the participants, you can live at your own will. Thank you so much. And I'm very grateful for today. Thank you.